Hey guys, uh, welcome back to Cricket Pros. Uh, it's been a long time since a video has been on our channel, so we're happy to start it back with one of the pioneers of cricket podcasts, an amazing writer, a huge cricket buff, just like all of us in the channel. And I know the intro is not quite as good as your son's, but uh, it is it is ours. And uh, but welcome on the show. No worries. Thanks for having me. Like Adi said in the intro, we've heard that you were quite a pioneer in the cricket podcast field and maybe even the first one to do so. How or what, um, what thing inspired you to do that? I, I started listening to podcasts probably maybe early 2000s, so when, when there were no podcasts. Um, and there was a couple of podcasters that I listened to at that time. Um, uh, there's a crazy one between a writer and a Catholic priest in, in uh, Australia um, talking about the weird things in, in Australia and the world. Um, and then I suppose not long after that, Kevin Smith had a podcast um, and I started listening to that and, and some of the other ones involved with that. And then when I got into blogging in 2007, by 2008, uh, uh, podcasts were kind of starting to get in. So I, I started a few. And yeah, I think at that stage, it was probably... If you went, if you put cricket into iTunes, it was probably like three. Like that's how old it is. It's iTunes, which doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, there are probably like three or four podcasts um, about cricket, and because it was something I always liked, I didn't really know what to do. So my most of my I had two early podcasts. I had one I did on my own, another one I did for a website called Crikey, an Australian website. And the one I did on my own, I would just talk about stuff, uh, which is really weird thinking back because it's kind of podcasts became like two or three or four people talking, but um, they did actually begin with a lot of people just on their own, almost doing a blog, but talking about it. Um, and then the crikey one was, uh, I think it was the 2009 Ashes. And so, you know, it was just an interview podcast. I don't even know how we recorded them in those days because the technology certainly hadn't caught up. And the other guy was in, I think it was in Melbourne or Sydney. No, I was in the UK following the Ashes. Um, and yeah, it was sort of, it was sort of done in that particular way. And then, um, and then over the years, I had a few more. I did a podcast briefly where I just uh, interviewed uh, county cricketers mostly and a few international cricketers. Um, then I had Gideon Haig on a podcast. We used to do that on Skype. Uh, but, you know, uh, me in the UK and him in Melbourne didn't always work time zone wise. Um, and then me and Andy Zoltzman um, started a podcast up together um, uh, for a little while. And yeah, I just, I really like the medium. It really wasn't until I started Red Inca and maybe Double Century that I kind of got the podcast exactly as I wanted them or closer to how I wanted them. Um, uh, probably with Andy was the only other time, but even then we were, the t technology wasn't ideal for us to record remotely perfectly. And we didn't have an editor or anything like that. So there was a lot of, there was just a lot of mistakes and Andy's a very quiet person. I'm a very loud person. Um, and so, you know, it didn't, ma it didn't seem to no matter how far away from me he was with his own microphone, you could still hear me. Whereas now, you know, we can do it via Zoom. We do most of our recordings via Lip Riverside, which is a really good app. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot more technology that's caught up with it. So I'm much happier about my current podcast than I've probably been about any of the older ones. Not that the ideas were bad. It was just, right. it wasn't, it, you know, the, a lot of the industry wasn't that. Yeah, it wasn't practical. Yeah. Also, the industry wasn't quite there. So right. trying to explain what you like. I remember trying to explain to Craig Info a, a, a narrative podcast. <laughs> and them just being like, well, you're not going to have a guest. Yeah. No, I don't need a guest. I'm just going to do yeah. this. No, you need a guest. <laughs> I don't need a guest. But, but it didn't exist at that time. That was before Serial, right? So right. Serial was probably a big game changer in podcasts um, because it was the first mm -hmm. podcast that non-podcast people listened to. Right. Um, and also it, could, it showed you that essentially the, it was endless what you could do with a podcast. Whereas I think before mm -hmm. then, I think the biggest problem that I had when I was trying to sell one or trying to you know get someone to pay for me for one it was like well it's just two people in a room talking and it's like obviously <laughs> podcasts can be a lot more than that and you know they've gone on to be a lot more than that yeah so um you know when you started talking about the podcast you talked about how you started blogging before you got into the podcast so like how did you like get into the cricket writing industry because now now you write like articles like every day there's like new come like new articles that come like once in two days, but how did you actually like, get into the like writing industry per se? 
So I was a professional filmmaker in Melbourne and the company right. wasn't going particularly well. And mm -hmm. so what, what tended to happen is we'd get a music video, we'd get an ad, and then we'd get no work for a few weeks after that. Mm -hmm. um, and we did, you know, school events and wedding photography and all sorts of things in the middle. Um, and we kind of, we wanted to know if there was something we could do to to still be a little bit creative, still use our creative skills that we had um, that could possibly either bring some more money into the company or just keep us alert, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I had a friend called Todd Spear, who's a basketball writer and has written a great book on Andreessen Petrovic and um, uh, works, uh, I think he works for NBA at the moment, but he's worked for Basketball Reference and, and many other organizations. Mm -hmm. And he was starting a blog and I'd written political blogs and comedy blogs and all sorts of blogs when I was younger. I sort of understood blogging and he was getting me to help. And at the end of it, he's just like, why don't you just start a cricket blog? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did. Um, and realistically, I didn't really think that much of it, but there'd only been, there'd only really been two massive cricket blogs at that point. Uh, there was Rick Ayers blog, which sort of morphed into Crick Info, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and there was Will Luke, who weirdly, I think around the time I started blogging, maybe he was hired by Crick Info. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, um, there was, because that wasn't another big cricket blog, I started writing about it. And very early on, I got a lot of attention. And I think a lot of the other cricket blogs were maybe more about a specific country. Right. And I was more interested in global cricket. Um, mm -hmm. And that probably came out a little bit. And then India and Australia played each other in 07, 08. And it was a horrendous series where everyone was a dick to everyone. And I think the Australian press came out on the Australian side and the Indian press came out on the Indian side. And I sat in the middle making fun of both sides. <laughs> and that really turned it from a very small blog to a massive blog almost instantly. And then from that, I think, uh, you know, the big advantage for me, that, which I didn't know, is there'd never been really a global cricket writer before. Because yeah. in the newspaper era, if you work for an English newspaper, they might want an article on Sri Lankan cricket, but maybe once every six months or 12 months, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they might want to know about New Zealand, but when New Zealand's touring, right? Yeah. And in the Crick Info slash internet slash blogging sphere, you had access to a lot more cricket. You could watch mm -hmm. streams from around the world. Cable TV had started to open up. Highlights packages had started to open up. Crick Info through StatsGuru allowed you to learn a lot more information. Mm -hmm. uh, social media was starting to you know, be invented at that stage. YouTube had, had a lot of stuff. And so I was just like, okay, um, I'm just going to keep writing about the things I like, but it turned out that no one had ever done that before. And so that turned into a bit of a career. And um, first, my first big break was editing spin cricket magazine in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. And that led to um, uh, that, that led to um, uh, working with Crick Info really, because George Dobell was kind of like a co-founder or co-owner of spin cricket magazine. He was being brought over to Crick Info. I'd done a little bit for Crick Info. And I think once I edited a magazine, I think they went from thinking I was the crazy guy writing weird stuff on a blog <laughs> to thinking I was a professional. Um, and so it was really that connection that sort of yeah. allowed me to get in. And what, I actually was hired at Crick Info to do videos. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of videos. I was the second video person they ever hired at Crick Info. And I did a lot of videos. And then um, uh, I was just, I just started sending pieces into the editorial desk. <laughs> I, I had the email. Why not? And I was at the ground for them. I was being paid by them anyway. Oh, yeah. And um, over, eventually, you know, I became more of a writer than a video person at Cricket. Mm -hmm. So how is it writing articles for ESPN constantly, doing podcasts, video projects, and how are you able to manage it all? Not well. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I think... I'm trying to think when it was. It was probably when smartphones came around. Up until smartphones, I think if you'd been around my life, you would have realized that what I had was about 24. Well, actually, that's unfair. I had about 200 unfinished projects at any one time. So I couldn't even remember what half of them were. I couldn't remember what I was supposed to be working on tomorrow. When smartphones came around, it allowed me to fix a lot of things in my life because no longer did I have to... I, I, I get a little bit... Um, uh, distracted. I get a little bit caught up in things. Um, 
uh, I get a little bit, I, I used to find it very hard to sleep. Um, all these sorts of things, and they all come from the same idea of these ideas bouncing around my head. Having a smartphone, uh, you probably can't see it in my office, but above my, above, above my head in my office, I have uh, maybe 70 or 80 completed notebooks. And notebooks are great, and they do help you remember stuff, but it, then you have to remember which notebook you wrote that idea in. Um, then you have to read your own handwriting at midnight, you know, all these sorts of, you know, stupid things. Uh, the, the thing that there was a couple of different programs that I got. One was a program called Jew, which was just like, literally, it's just like a app that buzzes when you for, at a certain time telling you you're supposed to be doing this job now could be, you know, cleaning your teeth or, you know, writing an article. Right. Um, I then got a program called Evernote which is absolutely brilliant. It allows you to tag all your notes. And it meant that in my phone was all my writing, right? Um, and now, now I use Asana and Todoist um, and all these sorts of things. And my, my big thing is sustainability. I think the reason most, pod, I mean, it's really interesting, actually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slag you guys off here. The start of your podcast, you did the worst thing that you can do, which is tell everyone that you haven't been producing any content recently. And they're right. And that is the sort of thing bloggers used to do all the time. And I used to say to them, don't, don't do that. Firstly, don't tell them that you haven't done anything recently. Just do the work. Right. But secondly, that's the biggest problem with people who have podcasts, with people who have YouTube channels, with people who have blogs, whatever it may be. It's not the ideas, it's the sustainability. Right. <laughs> I remember talking to the Football Ramble podcast recently and they were like, they were like, we might be talented, we might be funny, we might have a good view on football, but but basically we got popular because every Wednesday we put out an episode, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that sustainability, and it was the really the smartphones that allowed me to be able to do that. And it appears like I'm doing a lot of work, and I am doing a lot of work, but mm -hmm. I'm doing as much work as I can do. If you knew how many missed projects there were, if you knew how many, uh, well, let's let's see, let's have a look at my due. My Jew currently has seven missed items. My Todoist <laughs> currently has four. So that's 11 things I'm supposed to have done by today that I haven't done yet. <laughs> but my podcasts always go out on time. We try and make sure there's mm -hmm. a minimum, well, four or episodes uh, a week on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. we, can. Um, we certainly, uh, you know, we have the ability um, uh, uh, with writing, you know, I don't know how often I write, but I, I think when I started it, I was trying to do a minimum of two um, articles a week. I probably do closer to three articles a week. So I'm above what I promised everyone, all the people who are paying. Um, but a lot of that is just sustainable. So, you know, quite often I'm going to write something before I write something. I might get a podcast person to come on and talk to me about it. So now I've got a podcast episode on it, but now I've talked to them so I can use their knowledge um, and my thoughts uh, to make an article about it and that article can be turned into a video so to you yeah. i'm doing all this different stuff but in some cases i'm doing the same thing three different times but for three different audiences mm -hmm. um, and in slightly different ways for each one as well um but really uh, for me, I, I always think that and if, if you look at any of the the stuff i put online i've got my own online um sports writing course fans with laptops but even if you look mm -hmm. at some of the free stuff i've put online there's a lot of preparation in everything I do. And that's mm -hmm. so what I don't want to ever have to do is come is know I've got to do something and go and look at an empty screen. Yeah. Because if I look at an empty screen, I'm going to spend the next seven hours on YouTube just looking at old cricket highlights from the 60s, right? <laughs> what I really need to be able to do is get there, know what job, what I'm supposed to be writing, probably already have a plan written out, maybe even have some research done, maybe even have, you know, a, a complete you know, storyboard map made out, out. Mm -hmm. sit down. I've got two hours. Great. Okay. This is here. This is here. This is here. All right. Well, I can hit that for two hours and then I go, go, go pick, pick my kids up. And then at seven 30, mm -hmm. I start back up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all like really interesting about like the actual, your journey with cricket, but now I think we can maybe go on a little bit on the lighter side just talking about like you're like you as a fan of cricket. So uh, who's like one of your favorite players to watch? Just play cricket of all time. Of all time. All time. Um, I think the person who made me watch cricket the most was probably Brendan McCullum. 
Mm -hmm. I think that peak period from what maybe 2012 2013 through to 2016 yeah um i don't understand how you can like cricket and not want to watch every ball that he faced in that he, you know the good balls <laughs> yeah. and the bad balls and everything else it's really interesting watching baz ball come through now and thinking back to what it was like to watch one person from a country that's not particularly known for attacking cricketers um play the way that he did and mm -hmm. you know shahid afridi was similar in that it was a thrill a minute but I, I never felt like if I missed a Shahid Afridi innings, it was that big a deal. Because I felt with McCullum, if I missed a particular ball, you know, a ball, mm -hmm. um, it was, or even watching him in the field, diving around the field, everything oh, was an yeah. event. Um, so I suppose of recent times, it would probably be him. Um, I was a huge fan of Mushtaq Ahmed when I was a kid. So Mushtaq mm -hmm. Ahmed would probably be another one. Uh, uh, Dean Jones, there's a few Victorians um, that, that I grew up uh, loving. So yeah there's you know there's it, it could be a very long list if we start to go down <laughs> yeah so this is another fun and light one late nights or early mornings so i was always late nights um that was always my thing i used to love writing between 10 p.m and 3 and 4 a.m um no one can call you uh, no one can distract you you know, unless you've got a drunk roommate who's going to come in and at 1 a.m. back from a nightclub or back from a pub, um, you're not going to get bothered that much. Um, there's also, I suppose, at the beginning of the social media age, there were less people online at that time as well from your region, if you know what I mean. So it's a bit different now that social media is 24 hours and you probably follow people in different time uh, regions. But back in those days, it was a bit, it was a bit more one-dimensional. So... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think late nights for me, but then I had three children and late nights don't really work anymore. <laughs> so, uh, I think one thing when I had my children, even before then, I think I'd started to professionalize, as I told you guys with the apps and everything. But once mm -hmm. you, once you have children and you have other things, you really have to be, yeah, the most important thing I would ever say to anyone who wants to run a podcast or a YouTube channel or writing is remember that it is a job mm -hmm. and that if it is a job, you need to make sure that you're available. What? Let's say you've only got two hours a day to record, right? Then you need to know, then you need to hit that time and make sure you get the most out of those two hours. And for me, it's a very similar thing. You know, I've got a, I've got school pickups. I've got, you know, days off with my daughter. I've got mornings with my daughter. Um, I've got to take my kids to, you know, tennis and cricket practice and, you know, mm -hmm. all those sorts of normal things. So, you know, I have to be able to do that. So Andy Zaltzman, for instance, does a very similar thing to me, but then he does his work late at night. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a nine to five worker now, um, mm -hmm. uh, or nine to three thirty worker, I suppose. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, and then I have a second session after that. So yeah, sadly, I'm a morning person. I mean, I'm not really a morning person. I'd still sleep into noon every day if I could get away with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Now, okay, maybe now it's like a little bit of more like serious question or. Maybe not really serious, but like, how do you collect you all? Uh, maybe later after this interview, but uh, how do you collect the statistics that you do for your like articles or video projects? Yeah, I've got a lot of different partnerships. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do some work with Andrew Sampson, who's the, you know, probably the greatest statistician in cricket. Um, mm -hmm. He's got a database. You can pay, I think it's about 200 US dollars a year for that. Mm -hmm. um, that's really good. Uh, there's also Crick Sheets. Uh, that's available as well. That's very similar to what Andrew has. He's probably just a little bit more polished. Uh, Stats Guru still has a lot of great things. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have partnerships with other smaller companies and you know weirder back end companies and maybe less known um, organizations. Um, right. You know someone like Intelligent Cricket, who's probably an up and coming uh, analysis company. You know, I've been mm -hmm. talking to them. Um, and yeah, just it, there's no one place. I can't code. So uh, I have to go to a place with like drop down menus and, and it has to be easy for me as a human yeah. to be able to use it. But um, uh, I just collect it from as many different places as possible. A lot, a lot of people, if you've got a company or you've got information, a lot of people want me to um, promote their wares, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. with that, um, you know, with that sort of situation, it does become um, a little bit, um, uh, what's, uh, it becomes easier at my level than it would be for someone else just because, you know, yeah, 
you might get some random website who just wants to mention in your video or your article and they send mm -hmm. you their stuff. Yeah. So this next question is completely straying away from podcasts and writing and work. So what is the most used app on your phone? I don't know. Um, now staring at my phone intently, trying to work it out. Um, it might be the athletic, um, you know, uh, covers, covers the NBA better than anyone else. Um, so I spent a lot of time on there. Maybe the, it might even be the NBA app with all the games on it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, last night I was watching summer league basketball. So um, that one, is there like a usage thing I could do? Is there, a, is there a way we could tell this out mathematically? Can I? I think there might screen, be if you look at like time? the screen time. Mm -hmm. So what, what do I, okay, I'm in screen time. All right. Oh, no, I still Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still very. Yeah, Twitter, The Athletic, um, oh, Pocket Casts, Pocket Casts, which is where I listen to all my uh, podcasts, um, mm. and Spotify is another one that's yeah. up there as well, um, and yeah, the NBA app, I mean, it's not NBA season, so I suppose if you ask me an NBA season, it's probably the NBA app, watching, you know, random games, right. and highlights, and the condensed highlights, and all those sorts of things. <laughs> So the next one is pretty thought provoking. Um, one rule in cricket that you would like to change? Rule or law? I would say law. One law in cricket I would like to change. Um, I would go back. Well, I would go to the back foot no ball law again. I think the front foot no, no ball law puts too much stress on a human body. I think it is allowed for our bowlers to be taller. Um, I don't think it's allowed for them to be faster, though. I think the back foot no ball law can do that. It needs modifications because of the dragging. Um, but I do think that the back foot no ball law is um, better for human beings. And if we want people, if we want fast bowlers to have longer careers where they bowl fast, my guess is that that is fundamentally a huge difference. Also, if you play club cricket or anything away from the professional level, Front foot no ball law is impossible because you're literally you're looking down and then you have to look up and try and give an LBW if you're an umpire. It's a stupid, stupid law. Um, I understand why they changed it. I think a modification to the no ball, uh, the back foot no ball law would have been far better. Um, I think it's we've ended up with an inferior um, decision uh, decision making tool that also hurts people's bodies. I, I can't. I mean, that's about as bad as you can get. Um, that's like a fuck up on every level, really. And uh, we've managed to do it for about 60 years now. So the next question is a little bit more personal. Who is your favorite person to talk cricket with? Uh, oh, I mean, I, there's not, I don't think there's an individual person. Um, you know, I'm very, you know, uh, uh, Gareth Batty, um, is is a good mate of mine and i love i absolutely love talking cricket with him he gets really he's one of the few people that really likes talking about stuff very technically and so and i i think i pick up things that he doesn't pick up but then he has the ability to understand what i'm saying and explain it back to me and why it may or may not work um i used to have that relationship with ian o'brien we probably don't see each other as much anymore but he's probably another person that you could sort of work back from uh, George Dobell, uh, Ian O'Brien, uh, probably two other, uh, sorry, uh, George Dobell and John Norman are probably two other people. Um, uh, you know, I probably talked to cricket more, um, uh, with George than anyone else, just cause we sat together for so many games. Um, I still love talking to, uh, about cricket with my dad and my uncles. Um, they were sort of the people that sort of, you know, got me involved in the game originally. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, Usman Samidin is certainly um, another one. Sid Monga um, mm -hmm. is, is, is certainly someone else uh, that I love talking to. Neil Manthorpe, um, uh, Dan Norcross. Uh, you know, any, I like the people who look at it and know it really well, but maybe don't completely trust it or completely accept it, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's very hard to have a conversation with someone who's like, no, well, of course you do this because we've always done this. 
Uh, Trent Woodhill is another great person um, who, who I love talking cricket with. And, you know, I work with Brad Hodge um, and Roddy Eswick, you know, so two mm-hmm. incredible coaches there as well. So uh, of the coaching side, maybe Gareth Batty, um, Woodhill, Roddy Eswick and, um, and Hodgie are probably the ones. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of guys in the, in the media um, that, that I love to, but I kind of, for, for me, like if you're, I love talking to beat writers, so people who just cover one team and pay a lot mm-hmm. of attention. So, you know, someone like Raf Nicholson um, is someone who's great to, to talk to. You know, those sorts of people who, you know, Dylan Cleaver, uh, who know like everything about their particular beat. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Paul Radley in the UAE, those sorts of people. And that's mm-hmm. why they, those sorts of people end up on my podcast because those are experts on one particular thing. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, especially in my, if you look at my profession, I'm trying to cover every team, almost every league, every gender, um, every disability, if I could. Um, (laughs) And so for me, I, you know, being able to talk to someone who's an expert and go over for 25 minutes and pick their brain is uh, incredible. Right. Okay. And uh, our last question, I think this is like from watching your videos on your channel, like the amount of different topics that you come up with, how do you like, decide on what topic you want to make say like a video project about or like you know how do you decide on a topic so when i came into the industry i think Mm -hmm. what most people do is they work out what will be the most popular or the most newsworthy Mm -hmm. or the most important and i think that's how most journalists were trained before me i wasn't Mm -hmm. trained as a journalist i was a filmmaker (laughs) and i was like What's the story I want to tell? What am I interested in? What do I want to learn about? And so if I'm not interested in it, I won't do it. And so there's probably hundreds of stories I am interested in. I still haven't got around to just because I haven't had the time or the project's too big or whatever that may be. But that's essentially how all, the, all this works for me, which is I, I want to find something that I'm massively interested in. And, and then I want to tell it to other people and my theory has always been, if I'm interested in it, there will be a group of people who are interested in it. Now, sometimes that group might be super small. Sometimes mm-hmm. that group might be massive. But, you know, I remember going to Crick Info and saying, I'm going to write a feature on fast bowling hair. <laughs> I'm like, them just going, what? And I'll, and I'll say, yeah, I'm going to write a feature on fast bowling. And, and at first they were like, that's the stupidest thing ever. And that was probably one of the more popular articles I wrote. Because fast bowling hair is cool. Like it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got a theory on it, or you know, everyone's the different kinds of hairstyles, and you know, the different kinds of looks that fast bowlers have had, and the fact that the hair moves when they come in, right? No one cares about spinners' hair or batter's <laughs> hair, right? You got a helmet on, or you, you know, you're only taking five steps, but you're running in, and this hair is flowing out the back, or you bowl, and the hair comes back down over your face, right? That is not. When we're, if, if you're working in the old school system, you're not going to be there. People are just gonna be like, no, you're not writing a hair, a piece about hair. Just shut up and go away. <laughs> but I think, I think in that sort of more modern field, that's what you do. So I look at something that's interesting to me. And so, you know, the big video project I just finished recently is about the history of New Zealand opening batters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like you say that, and people kind of fall asleep before you finish your sentence. Right? <laughs> but it is interesting. Yeah. And the people and the stories and why they haven't been better and how much bad luck all these guys seem to have had. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact that they should have had great opening batters, but those opening batters went to England and all these sorts of different things that have happened in New Zealand cricket. Right. Um, I knew it was interesting. It's up to me to make it interesting for other people, but that's mm-hmm. basically what I do. I think it's, I think there are a lot of people who, I think there's a certain point when you're writing your article or you're making your podcast, or you're making your video, where you have to think, who is the audience for this, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're not making it for yourself, it will be shit, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. there are a lot of great country and Western music singers with incredible voices, right? Mm-hmm. Johnny Cash doesn't just stand out because he has a great voice. Johnny Cash stands out because when you hear him sing, even someone else's song, there's an emotional connection. He has decided that this is a song for him. And it may be about shooting up heroin, which he's never done before, right? But when Johnny Cash sings that, you feel like he has done that before. Mm-hmm. And when, he's, when, when, he, when he, he's doing that, 
it's really interesting. If you ever go back and you watch old clips of June Carter and Johnny Cash singing together, June Carter is such a more polished professional than Johnny Cash ever was, right? <laughs> because June Carter was trained from a young age of what it is to be an entertainer. You know, she, her jokes are always on point. Her timing's always on point. You watch Johnny Cash, he doesn't have any of that. <laughs> but when he sings a song, no matter what it's about, he always connects on it on a level above just a singer up being able to do that. Right. What you get is when you come into this industry, you get a lot of people who are writing a lot of things that they think other people would care about. Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> people subconsciously can tell the difference. Not consciously. If yeah. I went to 100 people and they'd be like, no, that's a, that's a good article. It's about this thing. Yeah. Subconsciously, they can tell the difference. And when there mm -hmm. is that little bit of your heart and soul in it, yeah, right, it mm -hmm. does transcend. And when you have the ability to then pick your own topics, which you guys are in a perfect position, you don't have to ever talk about Virat Kohli again. Right? <laughs> you don't ever have to talk about is Test Cricket dying again or whatever topic you don't care about, right? You don't have mm -hmm. to. When you're a professional, it's a little bit different. When you're a professional, you have to find that connection. And I always yeah. tell the story about AB de Villiers. There's a piece I wrote about AB de Villiers, which AB fans I absolutely love. And as you guys will probably know, AB fans are like a, a community on their own, right? <laughs> and it's not that I don't love him as a batter, but I never had that AB love, right? Mm -hmm. But one day, cricket folk come and go, you're going to have to write a feature on AB de Villiers. I'm like, okay. So what do I do? I look for the thing within his career that gets that passion out of him, that gets that mm -hmm. interest out of him. And I mm -hmm. follow that as far as I can. Mm -hmm. The AB fans don't care at the end of the day. Yeah. To them, it's just another piece on AB with a bunch of cool facts and, you know, I've, I've, you know, brought together. But for me, it's a completely different piece. It's not about AB values at all. It's about the evolution of cricket or cricket batting mm -hmm. styles. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what you were trying to do. So it's, I suppose there's a lot of old writers who would say what I do is very selfish because I'm writing for myself. But realistically, I always say if you're reading something that you've written and, and it's supposed to make you cry and you're not on the verge of crying, you probably haven't written it correctly, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the topics. If, if you're picking something that is a hugely emotive thing and you don't feel an emotion while going through it, then you probably haven't written it properly or you haven't thought about it. But if you're at the stage where you guys are, where you can pick whatever you want to do, don't pick the thing that you think will get you the most hits. Because I tell you what, if you make a video that's controversial about Virat Kohli, after seven videos that are controversial about Virat Kohli, A, you won't give a shit about anything to do with it anymore. <laughs> and your seventh video won't get the same amount of hits. Yeah. It has to be about the quality of the, of the product. It has to be about how much you understand of, of the thing that you're talking about. It has to be that you care that something has dr driven you to be able to do this. So with me, it's literally just what interests me, mm -hmm. right? And that may be New Zealand openers. I'm doing a thing on England and left arm seam at the moment. Those are just two things that just interest me, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, there's no rocket science here. I'm going to make this project better than I am than someone else's because I, it interests me. And eventually I will build an audience. The audience will trust me more than they'll trust another writer who, whether again, subconsciously, because they'll be like, Jared's written about this because he cares about it. Mm -hmm. Right. But everyone knows what, what clickbait is. Everyone knows what hot takes are. Right. Mm -hmm. Most people who wrote a hot take, Michael Vaughan has never believed anything he's ever said out loud. Right? <laughs> he just doesn't we most people know that already now yeah. right mm -hmm. if you want to go down that that road it doesn't seem to be that profitable to me but if you want to go down that road it's it's something worth doing i think you're better off going what am i interested in how do i share what i'm interested in with the world and i start with that and i very rarely think how many people will find this interesting because some of the things you know writing about asif kareem or aubrey faulkner no one was interested in Asif Kareem or Aubrey Faulkner before I wrote in them, right? When I wrote about Sean Tate's spell, there was like, you know, 300 hardcore first-class cricket fans who remembered Sean Tate's spell, right? <laughs> there wasn't an audience there. I made mm -hmm. something good because I cared about it. Right. That's the real thing. And 
you go back to when you asked before how I got into the industry. I got into the industry by finding a bunch of things I was interested about and covering mm -hmm. them properly, right? Yeah. I didn't get into the industry by running about India every day. It's always hilarious to me when you get a comment on the YouTube going, oh, you're doing all this for the Indian audience. If I was doing it for the Indian audience, A, I'd be doing two videos a day. B, <laughs> one of them would be about, well, and B, one would be about Rohit Sharma and the other one would be about Vera Cole. I'd literally, I'd do a video every morning about how shit Rohit Sharma was. <laughs> and I'd do a video every evening about how shit uh, Virat Kohli was, right? <laughs> and I wouldn't be interested and I'd run out and I wouldn't do it anymore. So, yeah. you know, I go and do a deep dive on um, island or, or power play bowling, which I did the other day, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And Boomer happened to take a bunch of wickets. So I mentioned Boomer, but the real piece is probably more about... Um, the wobble ball and how that's now maybe potentially yeah. affecting mm -hmm. white ball cricket. And I, I spent more time talking about the Island um, and the New Zealand game. Cause I covered that one more and yeah. there's a story in Zimbabwe cricket. And I want to do that. And, you know, I want right. to cover all these different things. And so it has to interest me because if it doesn't interest me, even if I get through the piece, mm -hmm. I'm never going to want it mentioned to me again or brought up to me again. And it's not going to build an audience. And I think a lot of people, when they try and make it big in this industry, try and make it big through viral stuff. I think, I think if you actually look at my career, I've had a remarkable career by almost never going viral, <laughs> right? Which means that every step of the way, I get a, a slightly bigger fan base on a slightly new platform or a slightly new yeah. website or whatever that may be, which, yeah. which means that people kind of stick around with you. Yeah. If you're mm -hmm. viral, you have to keep trying to be viral. And that no one, even no, even no one even knows how to be viral. People know how to put together good projects. People know how to put together things that they're interested about. Um, and that's kind of what I do. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We know a little over the time, but uh, yeah, thank you so much again. And uh, yeah. No worries. Thanks for having me on.